Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the results and the aftermath of the West Bengal Panchayat elections. We also talk about the death of two forest workers in Odisha that led to a massive protest last month. But first, we talk about Chandrayaan-3, India's third mission to the moon, which will take off today at 2.35 p.m. The mission aims to land softly on the lunar surface and explore it with a rover, an accomplishment which the previous Chandrayaan missions were not able to attain. If successful, then India would become the fourth nation to have done so. We now speak to Indian Express's Anona Dutt about the mission and the challenges it is likely to face. Anona, firstly, tell us when was the last time India tried to do this? So we attempted the previous moon mission was in 2019. In the same time frame, it was launched in July and it reached the lunar orbit in uh, September. So that's the same time frame about what we're looking at. But this time it'll be a slightly shorter mission, hopefully. And we will reach the moon on August uh, 23rd. And for those who may not know, tell us what would happen if everything goes according to plan this time. So the mission would likely almost be the same. What will happen is once the spacecraft reaches an orbit around the Earth, the orbit would slightly be increased every time it goes around so that it gets bigger and bigger to escape the gravity of Earth and get slingshot towards the moon. Once it goes towards the moon, once it's near the moon, the moon's gravity has to capture it. Once that happens, again, we start lowering the orbit and reach a 100 by 100 circular orbit around the moon, which is what the orbiter did last time. Once we're there, the lander and rover will separate from the propulsion module, which is carrying all the fuel, etc., and start a powered descent, basically go down to the surface and attempt a soft landing. And the last time we could not do that, right? The Chandrayaan-2 had crashed on the moon. What were the biggest reasons behind that? So moon missions are extremely like you know, it is space science. So it's quite difficult. And uh, US has tried it multiple times. Russia has done it. China is doing it right now. And we would be the fourth country that would land. And when we were attempting to do the soft land in 2019, just a few months before us, there was actually a mission from Israel, which also tried to do it and similarly crash landed on the surface of the moon. Since then, even with the pandemic, we've had uh, one mission that was carrying a lander rover from uh, Japan and a rover from the UAE and the spacecraft failed. So both didn't reach. So we still have the position vacant for the fourth country to reach the lunar surface and soft land. What happened last time and this, uh, the ISRO chairman uh, Somnath uh, explained in great detail a few days ago when he was in Delhi. He said that, you know, the last mission, the thrusters that are there on the lander, there were five thrusters and each of them gave a little higher thrust than was planned. The mission could still have been saved. But during the power descent phase for Chandrayaan 2, the lander had to click photographs of the landing site, verify that this is the landing site and then land. And during that phase, you couldn't move the spacecraft. It had to remain stable to take those pictures. So these errors accumulated and by the time that the correction started happening, it was already a little far away from the area where it was supposed to land. It had two contradictory messages. It had to reduce the velocity to make a soft landing, but also increase the forward velocity so that it could reach the place where it had to land. And that sort of resulted in it landing a little harder than anticipated and it crashed. Right. And what are the changes that people at ISRO have made this time so that this does not happen and we are able to softly land on the moon? So there have been changes that have been made since the last uh, mission. One is uh, they have done away with one of these engines of the lander. The central engine has been removed. So it's four thrusters. The legs have been made sturdier so that even if the velocity is slightly higher, it can manage the impact. Third, they have increased the area in which it is supposed to land. So earlier it was programmed to land only in a 500 meters by 500 meters square patch. 
Uh, now that area has been expanded to 4 kilometers by 2.4 kilometer. So in any place in that uh, box, wherever the lander feels is a safe landing, it would land. It has also been given more fuel so that if need be it can make a few course corrections it can go to an alternate landing site things like that then more solar panels have been added to its body because this time like uh, mr somnath said that uh, the planning has been kept done in a failure based manner that means that they have looked at hundreds of scenarios of what could go wrong and they've tried to incorporate changes according to that for example, the Chandrayaan lands and it's in a direction opposite to the sun. It cannot generate power to uh, stay alive for the 14-day period. So they've added more uh, solar panels. So a lot has gone into the planning. Then another major step has been that the previous lander depended completely on the photographs that it was taking while it was descending. The current lander already has a map of the moon from the Chandrayaan 2 orbiter. So we know exactly where we want to land. The only thing it has to do is click a photograph and confirm that, okay, I'm in the right place and land. So these are the changes that have been made. And Anona, when it comes to the landing, what is the biggest challenge? Is it the velocity? Is it finding the right landing spot? Is it the surface of the moon or just a combination of all this that makes it tricky? It's a lot of the things. So first of all, you're attempting a descent where you can't really control anything real time. It all has to be programmed. It has to be done by the spacecraft itself. The decisions in the moment has to be made by the spacecraft. So that is one challenge. Then while landing, you never know it. There could be a boulder. There could be a small crater which can topple over the craft. Then managing the velocity. You know, when we're traveling from Earth to Moon, it's at a very high velocity. And through this period, when there is the orbit is being lowered around the Moon, we are essentially reducing the velocity of the craft. And then during through the powered descent, when the lander is coming down to the surface, it is reducing that velocity and it has to land only at uh, two meters per second. So it has to lower its velocity to that level to safely land. So there are a lot of factors that go in and add to that the fact that uh, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere like Earth. So there is no friction from the air particles while you're going down, which brings down the speed of a vehicle, say on Earth, that doesn't happen on moon. So you have to control for all of those factors. And we also have NASA, the US space agency, helping India with this mission. Could you talk about the kind of help we are getting from them? So one of the scientific instruments that is on board the lander, it's called the LRA, which is a passive experiment where the sensor is placed on the moon and it helps you calculate very accurately the distance from Earth to moon and, you know, looks at this uh, Earth-moon system as such. It's a passive experiment and it uh, essentially helps NASA to plan their uh, human missions much better, which they are planning to go back to the moon. So it's for that purpose, but they actually tried to send LRA with the Chandrayaan 2 mission, which crash landed, and even with the Israeli bear sheet mission, which also crash landed the same year in 2019. So we're carrying it again for Chandrayaan 3. And next, we talk about the West Bengal Panchayat polls, which were once again marred by political violence. So far, a total of 45 people have died in the run-up to the elections and during polling, as a result of the clashes that took place between the opposition parties and the ruling Trinamool Congress, which ended up winning these polls by a landslide. The problem of violence, however, was so widespread that the state had to do re-polling in 700 booths. In this segment, my colleague Utsha Sarman speaks to Indian Express's Shantanu Chaudhary about the ground situation and what the results mean for the TMC. Shantanu, even though the polls are now over, this political violence is still going on. And it in fact started all the way back in June. So tell us the main reasons behind it and just how widespread it has been. Yeah, since the elections, we have seen that, you know, a, a large number of violence had taken place. In the pre-poll violence, you know, about 18 people were killed. And on July 8, when the election was held, 
at least 21 people were killed in several places across the state and on the day of the counting tuesday there were also some reports of violence that were taking place outside the counting centers and last night we saw that you know three persons were killed in bhangar area which is in south chobis pagnas district where it was reported that two isa workers were killed and one common man was also killed and that happened on the night of tuesday and today we also got reports that you know 10 people have been injured while they were making crude bombs inside a house and three of them are very critical but apart from that there has been fresh violence from the day of the counting in bhangar area which is in the south chobis pagnas district on the night of tuesday three people were killed two were isa workers and one were common man even today we are also getting uh, reports from the disturbances from that area and the reason uh, because is that you know the isa workers had alleged that the tmc had indulged in electoral malpractices on the day of the counting and they had changed the ballot papers they had you know influenced the accounting process so that's why they were you know, protesting against this kind of malpractices and there was a retaliation from the tmc and this led to a clash between the two groups which resulted in the death of two isa and one common man so these are the kind of reports that are being coming from the some pockets in the state that they have complaints against the counting process even we saw that you know yesterday the calcutta high court had also said that you know the final results of the panchayat election will be subjected to further orders from the court because the court is now taking into account all these incidents of violence and they will examine it they had also asked the state election commission to submit a affidavit before the court telling what are the steps that they are taking so the results may have been out but it will be subject to further orders from the calcutta high court that's what the division bench of the chief justice t s sivanandam uh, said yesterday right and speaking about the results we know that the tmc won by a huge margin this time but could you give us a sense of just how big a win this is for the party well going by the panchayat election results tmc just swept the panchayat election from jila parishad to panchayat samiti to gram panchayat tmc has won in a landslide margins in terms of jila parishads there are 20 jila parishads in west bengal tmc has won all of them and there are 341 panchayat samitis tmc has won 313 which amounts to almost 90% of the panchayat samitis that went to the tmc and when it comes to the gram panchayats there are over 3300 gram panchayats and the tmc has won uh, over 2600 gram panchayats so it amounts to almost 82% of the all the seats so it's like a tmc has won by a handsome margin. in in every tier of the three tier panchayat election but the bjp has come distant second that's what the result says and there was no such space for the opposition in the electoral politics right and can you tell us how the opposition parties are reacting to the results because before and during the elections they had alleged that the ruling party was engaging in voter intimidation and election malpractices well the opposition has uh, negatively reacted to the panchayat election results because they had been alleging that the election wasn't held in a free fair or peaceful manner as a large number of incidents of violence were reported from various districts across the state so the bjp which is the main opposition in west bengal said that you know the result does not uh, reflect the true mandate of the people in west bengal as the electoral process was totally vitiated by the ruling party cadres or the miscreants and uh, they feel that you know the uh, people's true mandate was not reflected and that is the same thing that the other opposition parties like the left front and congress has also said but tmc on the other hand said that you know the opposition had no space in west bengal and they had no support of the people that's why they were totally defeated in this uh, panchayat elections and this time we also saw bjp president jp nadda constituting a fact finding team to look into these allegations so could you tell us what the party has said about the ongoing situation yes following the allegations by the opposition parties in west bengal of a large number of incidents of violence and electoral malpractices the bjp sent a fact finding team to west bengal on wednesday it was led by former union minister ravi shankar prasad and yesterday they made field visits in north chobis pagnas districts several places and where they interacted with the people who were subjected to violence during the election and also the people violence today that the team made the governor cv anand bose in rajbhavan and also urged him to you know look into these kind of complaints so far the bjp's fact finding mission has ta- trained his gun at the mamta manji government saying that it didn't do anything to contain the number of violence that were taking place it didn't police to take action against the miscreants it also trained his gun directly at the chief minister mamta banerji saying that she kept mum for so many days uh, when the violence was going on 
following this kind of attack chief minister mamta banerji yesterday also held a press conference where she criticized this you know bjp's fact finding committee and also slammed the center for sending so many teams to west bengal whenever something happens and questions why such central teams uh, were not sent to manipur which has been witnessing a large number of violence for last one month right and shantanu what kind of impact do you think this panchayat elections will have on both these parties going forward considering the next is lok sabha polls yes this year's panchayat election results is likely to have an impact in next year's lok sabha polls the tmc which had won 22 seats in 2019 lok sabha polls will certainly likely to increase its tally given the kind of mandate it had received in the panchayat elections the bjp on the other hand will try to protect the seats it had won in 2019 it had won 18 lok sabha seats from west bengal so there is likely to be a very closely fought contest in next year's lok sabha polls that can be anticipated as both parties will try to win as many seats from west bengal as possible we also know that you know union home minister amit shah had given a call to the bjp to win at least 35 lok sabha seats from west bengal so therefore the task is a uh, very uh, challenging for the bjp and they will certainly try to get at least to at least 30 seats from west bengal and in the end we talk about odisha simli pal tiger reserve last month around 8000 frontline forest workers across odisha went on a protest after two forest workers within a span of just a month were allegedly shot dead by poachers at the Simli Pal Tiger Reserve both the victims forest guard Bimal Jaina and forester Mathi Hansda were killed in two separate incidents while on duty and forest officials say that this was the first time in decades that such an incident had taken place inside the reserve Indian Express's Sujit Bisoy who reported on this for the paper told us more about it Well, after this uh, murder of two forest uh, frontline workers within one month, I had visited to the Simli Pal area to speak to the frontline workers there about their problems. So many of them said that poaching activities was there since long. It's not that something new has happened, but there has been a new trend that the poachers start attacking the forest frontline workers. And when he spoke to the forest officials. they told him that it was very unusual for poachers to open fire in this manner now the simli pal tiger reserve is no stranger to hunting and poaching sujit says that locals from surrounding villages have indulged in bush meat hunting for years now in fact this massive tiger reserve spread across nearly 2800 square kilometers is the ideal hunting ground for poachers simli pal tiger reserve is only wild habitat in india to have uh, melanistic tigers royal bengal tigers then there are 55 species of mammals 361 species of birds 62 species of reptiles and endless flora one can find within simli pal area according to forest officials over the years poachers have been hunting wild boars barking deer and have also been occasionally killing tigers for their tusks but they said that poachers were never this aggressive sujit says that this rise in attacks by poachers of late could have something to do with the series of measures that were recently introduced by forest officials to clamp down on poaching activities what i sensed uh, after talking to so many forest frontline workers who were deputed there to guard the tiger reserve that uh, the recent increase in the enforcement activities within the tiger reserve so that could be the reason why the poachers are being so much retaliative they start attacking the forest frontline workers within the tiger reserve now the recent killings have also cast a spotlight on the issues that the park has been facing for years now like the shortage of staff the lack of infrastructure and the logistical support that the frontline forest workers require and this is what led to 8000 forest workers last month to start protesting these officials came to work but refused to go on their patrolling duties till their demands were met some of the demands uh, include uh, state government in 2008 had uh, announced to form one special striking force but uh, that's not yet uh, been implemented then they demanded to increase the 
exclusive amount from 4 lakh to 10 lakh then one of the major demand was to integrate the forest personnel because there are three categories of forest personnel one is territorial one is kendu leaf and others is wildlife so they had demanded to integrate all so that uh, there could be i mean exchange in postings so that one territorial staff can be deputed in wildlife and one after serving some years so these are the few demands which government has assured them to consider their demands by September 5th. After that, they have decided to withdraw their uh, protest and join duty. But despite the assurances by the government, one of the biggest concerns that remained was that of safety. Forest officials said that they were not equipped to defend themselves in difficult situations. And here it is important to note that after the 2008 Nyagad Naxal attack, all forest divisions in Maoist areas were asked to surrender their firearms to the local police. The fear was that Maoists could potentially snatch arms from forest personnel. And Sujit says that while some forest personnel were being given single or double barrel guns in rare cases, they were extremely wary of using them even for self-defense. What I got after speaking to the forest officials that the weapons they were issued are outdated. Even they lacked uh, legal immunity even they fired it to in self-defense. So there were certain issues. Even they were not trained. Uh, issuing weapon is not just uh, will help them because they were not trained how to use the weapon. Now, following the death of the two forest officials, a team led by the Director General of Forests visited the Tiger Reserve recently. In their report, the team recommended that state authorities should step up their intelligence network, patrolling and combing operations to check poaching. They also recommended that forest workers be granted immunity for using firearms for self-defense while dealing with poachers. And it seems that this recommendation worked and the government finally heard them. So after Assam and Maharashtra, Orissa is the third state to give legal immunity to the forest frontline workers to use firearms under Section 197.2 of the Criminal Procedure Code. And I spoke to some of the senior forest officials. They said all the incidents where the forest officials will use firearms will be inquired by one magistrate level officers. So only in case where they will feel that the inquiry will find that the firing by the forest officials was unnecessary or unwarranted, then only the forest officials will face trial. Otherwise, they don't have to face any legal problems. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, with help from Utsha Sermon, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it, share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com. 